Filming is, but they are not yet busy with the show. And they will. Welcome, everybody, to Meet Huset and our new focus area. Uh, I'm Helena Lindgren, I'm a associate professor at the Department of Computing Science, a few floor up. And we have a guest today, uh, associate professor Virginia Dignan from uh, the Technical University of Delft, who will be uh, giving a presentation on responsible AI. And since we take this opportunity also to collect all of you and tell a bit about what UMI University is up to at the moment. We, apart from uh, being part of the national effort on the Wallenberg Foundation has on autonomous systems and AI and software systems, the VASP uh, program. We are also involved in organizing uh, one of the largest AI conferences in the world. It will take place in Stockholm this summer. So there will be two weeks of full of AI events, machine learning, uh, other kind of AI, autonomous systems, multi-agent systems in two weeks in the summer. We will gather uh, five plus 4,000 researchers from the world to Sweden. And we may start organizing that, which we're happy for. And this, you can see this as a pre-event for that <laughs> as we're starting, like, uh, going yeah. out strong because we care about the ethics and social aspects of AI. Uh, so Virginia is uh, frequently invited to speak about these things, both yeah. at the EU level and in conferences and any place where people care about these things. And I'm happy to Thank give you. the word yeah. for you. I'm now. very happy to be here. Give Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you all for being here. I'm very happy to be talking to you here. I've been talking to very big audiences, but I think I never talk to an audience where they are standing room only, so it's nice to see the interest here. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm here in Sweden, but uh, if it's anything like the rest of the world, you can hardly start open up a newspaper or start in the news on television without hearing some uh, very scary stuff about AI or some uh, pictures of the Terminator or Elon Musk saying all kinds of stuff about how dangerous AI is going to be and to kill us, all of us, or I don't know what. And I can imagine that you might be worried about what AI really is going to be uh, meaning in our uh, society. And indeed, there are all kinds of reasons to be worried about it. And in what I'm going to tell you about today is about ways that we should take care in order to ensure that those scary futures are as controlled as possible uh, by the activities and the actions that we are going to take. Uh, like Elena says, this is an uh, effort where I've been involved like for the last two years. Uh, basically, it's all the time that people really have been uh, actively taking steps to uh, talking and to discussing the issues of the ethical and the societal impact of artificial intelligence systems. And in many cases, uh, when we think about artificial intelligence, we think mostly about those systems which are uh, uh, learning, the machine learning systems, deep learning, all those kind of issues uh, come up. And indeed, that's one of the important parts of AI, that we build artifacts, we build artificial systems which are uh, able to learn and therefore to adapt to all kinds of circumstances. But that's only one of the aspects which are uh, studied and developed in artificial intelligence uh, research. 
and it's also not the issue which is, let's say, the most scary. The, what can scare us or what can be worrying for us is that those systems which are going to learn and to adapt to our uh, environment are going to do that autonomously and moreover they are going to interact with us in all kinds of possible uh, and in, uh, ways. So when we combine learning systems which are autonomous and interact in the same world as we are, then we can indeed uh, wonder whether that is going to be something we really uh, want and that we are really going to be able to control and to um, to really uh, make, to sure, ensure that these type of systems are there to be of benefit for us as people and uh, for the environment and well. So we should probably really, uh, well, why should we care about this type of system? So like I say, uh, they are going to act, act autonomously, and probably you just all heard this week that self-driving uh, self car from Uber who unfortunately killed someone in, uh, in the roads. No one was telling how many other people were killed in the same day in the roads, which were not killed by a self-driving car, but in it, uh, we can expect some profits, but we have to worry about the those issues. So they are going to act autonomously and the control that we have over those systems can be quite different than what we have now. And the whole idea is that why we are doing this? Because we want to have systems which in whatever direction or whatever application they are, they are going to do things better than what we can do it. But of course the question here is what is better? And there are many ways to define better, and there are a lot of work being done about what do we mean by developing systems that are better than us, and what does does that mean that whether they are when they are better in some applications and some contexts, will they really become better in everything and anything, and creating all those ideas of super intelligent systems which will uh, take over in all all aspects of life. So if this is the setup in which we are looking at. Then as we develop these systems, and this is an idea, so we are designing these systems. That's what we have to remember. It's not happening to us. We as society, as researchers, as governments, as users are designing and developing and using these systems. They are not just coming from thin air and appearing. It's an artifact that we are building. And because we are concerned about how the artifact and how the issues are, uh, these kind of issues, then we want to make sure that as we design these systems, we have to put the purpose, to design the purpose of these systems is the purpose that we really want. And this is something which is not new, it's something which uh, Norbert Wiener already said in 1960, even uh, around the same time that AI appeared, and it's actually something which we even know from much before. I suppose you all know the story of King, King, King Midas, yeah, King Midas wished to some intelligent entity that he, everything he would touch would turn into gold. And uh, abstractly, looking at that abstractly seems like a good idea, the guy would get very rich. But it was really taken literally by the machine. And indeed, everything he touched, including his food, his family, whatever, everything turned into gold, which was not exactly the purpose. So we have to be really very careful, especially because machines are not able to understand the nuances and are not really able to understand, yeah, you say I want everything turning into gold, but of course I'm not meaning the food or my wife or whatever, that we make those purposes very clear. And that is our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the system to decide what we care about. So just to give you a very short motivation, it's not a project I was, was involved with some colleagues of mine, and I know that some of you are here are working on um, systems which are meant to help in all kinds of healthcare situations. In this case, it's about a system which would help elderly people living longer at home, which is something which I suppose here in Sweden is also an issue, to support independent live, living as long as possible in a way that people are really uh, being taken care of, but they don't really have to go move into elderly homes and so on. So this is the concept of the smart fork. The smart fork would help this guy uh, ensure that what he's eating is uh, what the kind of things that he should be eating, because probably he might have some health issues which doesn't allow him to eat 
uh, bacon and eggs and all kinds of fat stuff. So the smart fork should be helping you. And I'm just going to see if this would work. Uh, I don't know. Well, yeah. all are, so, as you hit, it's double O. Yeah. So it is going up, so you keep the information about oh, what it's doing. You don't really have to know what it's saying. How many calories is eating? So we are measuring everything, and you get the information. You are eating twelve salt. And uh, you, get, you help him in all kinds of ways. So you already ate too much fat and all that kind of thing. So we are really trying to help the guy to create a healthy uh, environment. Probably it was meant uh, by whoever did it in the very best of the intentions, but uh, the intentions or the purpose that some of us think it should be the system, like King Midas, is not exactly what everybody would think. It's so now we see here our big guy with his smart fork. So yeah, the system yeah. is fine, the guy is fine, everybody is happy, but we somehow miss the purpose of the whole thing. So it is not, the, there is no smart fork, it's just a, a, a joke, let's say, but it's just to show that as we develop things, and really if we really want to develop things, this kind of systems and this kind of support, which can indeed provide a lot of good for a lot of people, we really have to be sure how we are going to do that. And we cannot leave the decision on how the smart fork works or not to us, the engineers who are sort of out at one. But we really have to get everybody involved. The old guy, probably his family, his physician, everybody around, because everybody has a different idea of what is the right purpose for the machine. So we need to know who is involved, who is designing it, what kind of values are important? Is only the value of the health of the old guy? Maybe also the value of his own pleasure in life. If you only eat salad, probably lives very long, but it's not the happiest life for that guy. How we do when we want to balance between different principles, different values, the economic value, the health value, the uh, privacy and the uh, independent living, those things you cannot really put them all together and you cannot manage them in many cases in a way that we satisfy all of them uh, equally. So we have to decide how we do, how we pr prioritize those values and how we can put things together in a way that is the best for everybody involved. So the whole idea of uh, responsible AI and the things we do is not really like creating new algorithms of uh, new ways of doing things, but really going about yeah. uh, going around this, uh, ensuring and make sure that what we are building is indeed important for all mankind. And there are many different initiatives around the world at this moment that are concerned about this kind of issues, also concerned about codes of conduct, about regulations, and so on. And basically what we do in the, this area of responsible AI, there is some virus there, some intelligent machine that didn't understood that we were talking and didn't want to be warned at the moment. But there are three types of things that we can do in this area. The first one is what we talk about ethics in design, and that means that as we go about developing all these types of systems, the development process that we take should be as much as possible inserted in the expectations and in the uh, principles and in the ethics and the values that the communities that are around it and are going to use it uh, are taking into account. The second one is ethics by design, and that is the idea that we can or we could build systems who are able to themselves, the artificial system, reason about what is the ethical action to take and what is not. And by doing that, then they can understand what we value, which they should understand what we value. And finally, there is the area of ensuring that as we do all this type of work, which really impacts and is going more and more to impact the way all of us live, that we have some kind of regulation, some kind of certifications, maybe even codes of conduct to ensure that things are done in a proper and verifiable and certified way. I will go in my presentation a bit through the three of them, and I hope that we have enough time for it all. So in the ethics in design, the idea is that 
because the systems are going to take those uh, um, decisions that influence us, we want, and there are, like we all know in the life, we know that machines don't. There is, in many situations, not one right choice, and you have to choose between things which are equally uh, not the best, but you have to make a choice. So then we have to make sure that if we build these systems, we ensure what we call art, accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And the idea on accountability is that we don't really know exactly how those systems should function. And it will be less and less likely than any of us, including the ones who know about artificial intelligence but are not really directly involved in a specific system, will get more and more difficult to understand what those systems do. But we do in line, in the example there is the, when you go to the supermarket and you buy eggs, you don't know whether the chicken which is being, the eggs of the chicken that is being sold as a free range egg you don't really know yourself. You didn't went to the farm to check if that is indeed a free um, ranch chicken. But you believe the certifications and the uh, process putting around it, which make the accountability, they make account for the veracity of those things. So we can think about this type of processes of certification to make sure that AI systems are also guaranteed to be of a certain type. Also, we might want, there are many ways of doing things, like there are many ways of producing eggs, and you might want to enforce a certain minimum of quality, of, of uh, purpose in those systems. And the, I don't know if you know what this thing is, anyone? Sorry? A muffler, a catalyzer. This is something which all cars in Europe nowadays have, but no car in the world needs that thing to drive. It is uh, put into the cars as an extra thing to order to ensure that the cars will be less polluting than what they would be without it. And it is fully a decision, a social decision, let's say, of adding these things to the car. I remember at the time, like in the 90s, when these things started being the law, I was working with, together with Volvo, and a lot of the engineers there were quite upset about this thing, yeah, because the efficiency of the car will not really be so good, and the, this is all, all kind of extra work, why do we need this? And because those things were enforced, there was a law that says, yeah, all the cars in Europe need to have the catalyzer, then, it also helped the car industry to think up of better ways to make cars efficient, even though you have this type of regulations. So that is the kind of issues that we also want to consider for artificial intelligence. If you talk with people on, uh, we do machine learning, we do those algorithms for deep learning or whatever, people are very concerned about, yeah, the, it should be optimal, it should be efficient, it should be optimal, it should be the best. And they think that every, or in many cases, they will think that any regulation or any directives onto those algorithms will make them lose, lose on efficiency. But if you really think, yeah, it's very important that those algorithms can be explainable, or that our algorithms are going not to be biased or discriminate or whatever, then we can put those regulations, like we put the catalyzers. And by doing that, I'm convinced and I'm pretty sure that we will also help developing better algorithms which will be as efficient or maybe even more efficient than the ones are now, but which guarantee that the level of pollution, like in the catalyzer, is there. So this is the kind of things which we want to ensure. Because we are responsible for these systems, we need for taking that responsibility, we need the systems to be accountable, to have all kinds of extra regulation, extra kinds of issues which we can guarantee. And in other end, we need them to be transparent because we really want to understand that indeed the system is using the catalyzer, to take again the same example, in the correct way. So there is a lot of work doing that. The, these principles for AI, there are many types of different sets of principles, but basically they are all end up in this type of ideas. You need responsibility, you need accountability, and transparency. You need art. The, the accountability, to make sure that systems are accountable for what they do. 
it's a lot to do here in this area about explanation, that the system is able to explain. And like I just said, the optimal system is not the one who is the most efficient in terms of time and the use of computer power, but is the system which can explain what is there. Because if the system doesn't explain, we can never really have the trust that the system is doing what is being doing there. I'm not really going into this kind of details, uh, the other one is that we want to be sure that what we value, what is important, is indeed built into the system and that we can account, account for any fun functionality of the system to be according to what the norms that we accept and that we think is important and which interpret the values and the principles that we uh, take for uh, important. About the responsibility, and that is our responsibility, and there is a lot of discussion now who was responsible for killing that lady this week with the upper car. The car is not responsible. There is a lot of discussion that maybe those systems should be taken as legal persons, they should be given personal goods, they should be given responsibility, but they are systems. There are all kinds of people around, all kinds of users, developers, also the government will set up the rules and so on. So we need to make sure that we understand that line, that chain of responsibility in order to understand how to uh, judge the failures, but also the success of the car, who was responsible to make the car uh, driving correctly or so on, in the, if you take the example of the car. But also it's a lot to do about how much and what type of autonomy do we want to give to the car. Do we want the car to drive us to where we want it to go, like we do now, or do we want the car to start taking decisions for us where we have to go or not? It is possible. We can build, theoretically, we can build cars which decide that they are not taking you to the McDonald's. But do we want that? That's not a decision, again, for the car. It's a decision for ourselves, for our governments, for our uh, societies, and so on. Which autonomy we give the car is our responsibility, again. And another one is, uh, you probably know Sophia, this robot, have you heard about it? It even got some uh, citizenship from the, uh, the Saudi Arabia. And the point here is not that we cannot build robots who look like people and will have emotions and so on, but we should be very aware of the responsibility we are taking by doing that, especially when, the, when this type of robots are going to be in interaction with users who don't really have the same capability, like maybe elderly, like people who are sick, like children, and so on. So it's again up to us to decide, do we really need systems who look fully like humans? Do we want to uh, risk this idea of mistaken identity, of needing people to believe one thing or another? It is again our responsibility to decide. And to take the consequences for the decisions that we make. In the transparency, there is a lot. <laughs> Two things, when we talk about transparency, people often start thinking, yeah, we need to make algorithms which are really uh, transparent, that we can look into the algorithm. But that's usually not really the biggest problem and also not the most interesting. We can always give the code of the algorithm. You want, uh, you want to know how it works? Here is the code. Please go ahead and look at it. Most of us would not be very happy with that. We have much more to look at being transparent about the processes and the situations in which we build these systems. And also we have to make clear that we can manage the expectations of people while they are interacting with these systems. So this is a chatbot who went all wrong some years ago. If, because it was not properly trained and it was not sufficiently trained yet when it was interacting with people. If you would put some kind of uh, announcement, look, I'm still learning, like it used, used to be normal in Portugal when I learned to drive, to put something like that uh, for the new drivers, that other drivers would understand that that one is a new one, then you would have another type of expectations of algorithm. You would say, okay, it's, uh, it's like a kid, he's still learning and uh, well, I might make mistakes, might, might say stupid things, but it's learning, so let's help this thing learn as best as possible. So that's one way. And the other one is about, not so much about the, the, the algorithms, like I say, but to be sure that we understand what data are we using there. And if, you, if we are open and transparent about the type of data that we are using for the algorithms to, to be trained and to be used, we 
solve very simply, or at least sim more simply, the, many of the problems which are related to the transparency of the algorithms. And as we are talking about data, it is often nowadays the idea that data is the new oil, and that we have to be sure, and that is you see all over the world, from governments to organizations to companies, we have to be sure that we collect all the data that we can collect, and the more data the better, and we all know what we did for wrong to our planet by uh, the way we dealt with oil. So I would say that we should be conscious to deal or to think about data like oil because we might get into the same kind of problems. By the way, data is a, nowadays one of the largest users of energy in the world. To keep data, we need huge data farms, like they call it, and they are really very big. And those things use an incredible amount of energy. So if you know about bitcoins, I believe that to uh, mine bitcoins, you use more energy than what the city of New York uses. And there is a uh, Google as a farm, a data farm north of the Netherlands, which uses more energy than all of that province in which that city is. So we are already with hoarding data, we are already affecting our planet in probably ways that we don't want. And moreover, because we are keeping all that data, we are being responsible for that. Then we'll have all the issues of privacy, of security, of people which are using the data like Facebook and the Cambridge Analytics for things which we don't want. So I would say we need to be very concerned and very... Uh, 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 very... Uh, thinking very well about the ways we want to use that data and to be thinking, do we really need all those kind of data that we are now keeping? Uh, so basically, this being responsible, this whole art of AI is about making choices and being explicit about those choices and make clear that what we do is uh, documented, is regulated, and basically this is not really much more than what software engineering is about. Let's be consistent and coherent and document all the choices that we make. So I will just move a bit of this one because I want to show the other one. Well, that's basically the same thing, but with a bit more detail. So now let's go to the ethics by design. In this case, the holy grail, let's say, is to build something like this. Let's build a computer type of component, hardware or software, which if you put it in any system, that thing will guarantee that the system is ethical. That would be great. So then we don't have to worry anymore about those systems. We are done about it. But what does it mean? And what do you need? To, uh, you need to understand ethics, to use ethics, and to hopefully being ethical at the end of it. And if we look at ourselves as human humanity, we have been studied and discussing and doing things on ethics for I don't know, 10,000 years, 5,000 years has been written down, and we are still not really completely sure of what ethical means. So the question is, if we don't really know ourselves what it is, can we build systems which would be more ethical than we are, or at least as ethical? So indeed, we need three things. We need first, for this, assuming that we can build these systems, we have to tell these systems what we value, what are the principles that we value, and hopefully agree between all of us, that what we value is something which we all agree on. Then we have to tell the system, yeah, if those are the principles that you value, then these are the rules or the theories or the steps that you have to take to ensure that what you do is in line with what you value. And later on, we have still to implement that, because at the end of the day, we have to develop the code for those things. So let's go one by one. The value alignment, what we value, probably we all have some hopes of some ideas that there are some abstract human values that everybody in the world believes on. There are also all kinds of sources where you can look at, uh, codes of law, codes uh, of ethics, the law of a country usually says something about what's important in those countries. There are all kinds of social practice, the way you do things with each other shows how important some things are for us or not. So we can look at those issues. The problem here is that things which we accept as a community are not necessarily always the things which are ethically acceptable. And they are also not always the things which are um, legally allowed. 
And I, I come from Portugal, and I can tell you that the way we, as society, look at paying taxes and what the laws of Portugal says about paying taxes is not completely in line. And there are many more. You can you think a lot of examples. You can think of many examples of this kind of things. Also, this thing changed in diet. 50 years ago, we would, we would all be smoking here. Now we are not. 200 years ago, we would have some uh, uh, capital uh, penalty and things like that. And we would accept that as being normal. So those things change. So it's very difficult to come up with a value that we all agree on. And what we do in country, because that's something which in society is the case, we have elections. And we ask people to tell us, yeah, this is what we, what, what's important for you. We aggregate that all. And then we decide, so the ones who, it's the things which the most people agree on are the things which we follow up as a country. Not always with the best of the results, but that's another issue. But what we are doing now is try to use this type of ideas, the idea of aggregating what people believe is the most important, to build systems which would then use that as the ethical behavior. I don't know if you ever saw this picture. This is a study done by the MIT in the United States in which what they want to do is to ask people what should the self-driving car in top do in a situation oops, where it cannot anymore deviate the only, or it cannot anymore stop and it's going to have an accident. What should this car do? Should it go straight or should it take the decision to go to the side. And they have asked this to, I believe, 40 million people, or 40 million times have been answered. And the idea would be you can aggregate that all, and we have some kind of ethics by crowdsourcing. Most people think we should go straight, or they could go to the side. Then we take those type of decisions. And I can guarantee you that in this room that there are people who think it should go straight, and people who think it should go to the side. Case. And there are all kinds of issues here. If you look carefully at the picture, there are uh, more people in the road than in the car, but the people in the road are crossing with a red light, which in some countries is kind of a capital pen uh, penalty almost. Uh, there are uh, some of these people are kind of people which are good for society. They are supposed to be doctors, they are kids, they are dogs. There are other ones in the car and so on. So what kind of information do you want to take into this type of decisions? And the guy, fortunately, we have philosophers around the world so for many years, and they have been at it for many, many years, and they have come with all kinds of ways to decide if this is, uh, human life is important for you, or if uh, privacy is important for you, or if whatever is important for you, these are the ways we should behave in order to ensure those values. And I'm not going into them. There are main, mainly, if you believe me, three types of categories. There are philosophers who say that the results of what you do is what is important. So you should look at what is the end of the, what you do and see if that result is good, then you do that. There are other philosophers like Kant, which says, no, the results are not important, your action should be good. It can always happen something that the result then is not good, but if you took consciously the action that you could do, then you did it well. And there are uh, other ones, even older, Aristotle and Confucius and so on, say, it's actually not about your results, not about your actions, it's about your motives. Why did you decide to take that step or that action? So if you take this a uh, few uh, thousand years forward, and we talk about self-driving cars, we want them to be ethical, to do things in a way that is good for everybody. So we are going to interpret, like I showed in the slides before, what would the utilitarian car do in the case of a dilemma like that? Anyone? Here is the important is the number of victims, the result. So you should maximize the best result. So probably what this car would do, the, what it wants, so it's the best for most, the results are important, so it would maximize lives. So it would count how many are in the road, how many are in the car, and then where there are most, we save those ones. Then you have the Kantian car, 
which the idea is you do no harm. It's very important that you don't explicitly take an action which would be bad for someone. And if you do that explicitly, then you were wrong. So this car would probably never take the conscious action to deviate from its plan, original plan, and take the conscious action to move to a, another road, because that would harm some people in those cases. And then we have the Aristotelian car, and that one is even more complex, because they didn't have cars there at that time, I think. And the idea is that the motives are important, they really act from the pure, pureness of motives. And probably, and again, it's kind of interpretation, but one way, oops, one way to look at that is that to be the best possible motives is to take care of the ones who are less, disadvantaged, less advantaged. And in this case, probably would be the pedestrians because they are not protected by us. So you see that even if we agree that the value of maximizing life is what those cars should take, or, to take care of, we still can build cars in many different ways. So I wouldn't be surprised that soon when we can buy uh, self-driving cars, we can choose not only the color, but also the type of behavior of those cars. And it's up to you to decide. And maybe it's up to you also to personalize your own car. Uh, yeah, then we have to implement them. And there are also many ways to implement Let me just, can, you have to do decisions at all. Uh, at all, all times, but just let's see. We don't, in a sense, I've been talking about developing a car which is able to design ethically all those kind of things, or as an example for those types of systems. But actually, we don't really need to take always the approach that we are going to let the car do, or the system do everything by itself. We are interacting more and more with these systems in our own environment, so we can take other types of options. So instead of the algorithmic option in which the machine is going to calculate and deliberate about all those things and come up with a solution, we can have some kind of collaborative approaches. There is a person in the car, and the car and the person, they can together decide what is the best option. You don't have to leave the old decisions to the car. This is complex because the person might be reading the newspaper and not uh, really paying attention. It also is complex because every person has its own uh, ways of thinking. It's also complex because that's what we have now, and people are very good at killing each other in the roads. So maybe we didn't really get much better than what we are now. So there are other types of options. Other one is to take care globally, collectively, take care of the old solution. So develop infrastructures which ensure that all these dilemmas don't appear. For instance, one possibility would be to build roads which are only guaranteed and possible to be used by self -learning, for self-driving cars and other roads where people can walk. So if you separate those things, it would cost a lot of money, but it would be a, possi a possibility. Another one is what in the Netherlands we are experimenting with, is to create a collective control over all the cars who get into the freeway then they release control to the freeway, and the freeway decides together for all those cars what speed and what distance they should all go, and then when they get out of the freeway, they continue their own thing. So that's, again, a way to regulate it all together. And of course, we have a last option, and that is to leave things to random. It's the easiest one to implement, but probably not the one which provides us the most trust. But again, it's what I want to show with this, that. There are many options. It's not for the car or for the system to decide about those options. It's about to us, and not only us, the developers or the computer scientists who are going to build these things, but to us as a society, as the users, as the uh, governments, as everybody, to decide what we want these systems to be doing. Because we cannot have it all. Whatever we build, if we want to ma maximize every possible principle, we never really get there. We have to make choices. We have to sacrifice something on efficiency or something on costs or something on whatever because we want to have privacy or we want to have safety or so on. And there is not one way which is right in all cases. So it's always options there. So again, the idea is one of making it all again, for, according to the art principles, make it all explicit, make it all open, make clear what were the options that you took. 
Okay, and the last one is, for many years we have had societies uh, depending on some types of professions. We have depended on the doctors to make us better, and we want doctors to promise their Hippocratic oath that they will do their very best to uh, take care of our health. We have take uh, have uh, military to take care of our safety of our countries, and we also want those military to act ethically and to make sure that they are not really uh, going uh, doing uh, war in a, the wrong. We have all kinds of rules about what is a good way to uh, do war. So there are all kinds of rules there. We depend on our architects to build, build houses that are safe. And again, there are all kinds of regulations and things we expect from architects and so on. So actually, we are at the moment, I believe, in which we also depend on our software architects to build those systems which will benefit us the most. So maybe we should take the same kind of approach that we take with other groups in which we rely on and demand from software engineers, from computer scientists, from developers of all these kinds of systems, that they take some kind of uh, conduct, uh, that they have some kind of minimum conduct which ensures that they are not doing that explicitly for the wrong, but they will take into account the best of their, uh, the best of their means to use things good. And the, uh, the other ones which I've talked already about, is those type of regulations like we put in the free range X, if you want. We can also really rely on some independent bodies that understand what the systems are about, and we rely on them to give some kind of certificate, some kind of samples like in the X, which tells us we don't understand exactly how, how those systems work, that it is a system which has been developed according to a certain set of regulations. That's actually with what some groups are doing. The most known and the largest of these groups is with IEEE, which is an engineering, international engineering society, which has like a few million members, and of which they are taking really seriously into concern the development of guidelines, of regulations, and also uh, as well developing some standards, really, which indicate what are the type of behaviors or the type of issues that we want when a system is dealing with privacy or what is doing about data protection, minimum safety for robotics and so on. And at the same time, we are also looking at developing these agencies which can audit existing systems and give those certificates. So there are uh, also in this type of more regulatory and aud auditing thing, all kinds of initiatives happen in order to ensure that if we are not going to be able to build those systems which are super ethical and will do solve it all themselves, and if we are taking all kinds of choices as we go and some choices might be better for one thing and not so good for another, that we have other ways to align the design with the ethics that we want and to verify those kind of things. So basically what the idea of this talk is, and I think I'm quite on time, is that uh, AI is influencing our lives already now and it will influence it much more. And it's not only for the designers, for the developer, for the nerds if you want, to build those systems and to take all the decisions, but it is for all of us as a society, and especially as governments, as uh, uh, civil, uh, civil society groups and so on, to decide and to enter the discussion and take a role in the responsibility that we all have for what we want these systems to look and what we want these systems to do for us. Because Knowing ethics is not being ethical, it's not for us, and also definitely not for the systems. And we need to build systems which take into account the principles that we really believe are important. And that we, the, the, we shouldn't forget that we, as society, are building these systems. We are all responsible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. I think we have time for questions. I'm sure you would be interested.
Thank you. Um, I would like to catch up in the end here. You said that uh, society should um, uh, has its values imposed on these systems that are developed. How do you see th what links are between the development and society? How do you think that the members of society can express and transform these expressions into yeah. the building of these systems? Some of the most obvious uh, activity, uh, things taking uh, place in that area is through government. We, at least here in the West, we elect our governments and we can ask them to take a decision and to take steps in this. Uh, I don't know if I indicate, but at least at European level, they are taking this very seriously. The European Union is coming up with the, the GDPR, which is a regulation concerning the use of uh, uh, data with respect to the privacy of the citizens. So from May on, all uh, people who use data of European citizens have to take into account those rules. Whether the rules are the best or not, it's not really the point, because these things are evolving. But it's one of the actions. And also, next week, I actually will be in Brussels talking with the, the president of the European Com Commission, uh, Juncker, and other people there, because they really want to come up with a kind of uh, strategy document about what AI and the role of AI in Europe. So that's one way to do it. Another way is also to enter the discussion in all kinds of ways, like here I'm telling you, but uh, there are in many places and in many uh, levels ways to uh, discuss and to uh, participate. Also take actively the choice to use or not to use all kinds of systems, depending on how those systems, and that Therefore, we need to have that we understand what are the values of those systems. But we all, without any problem, cross the box which tells Google, yeah, please do whatever you want with our data. We just cross it without reading. None of us. I also don't read those things. But then we allow these companies to do with our data whatever we want. If we take a bit more both ways, that Google gives us a bit more, or that Facebook gives us a bit more information about what exactly their, plan, their plans are. And in other than that we really take active the, uh, steps to do it, we don't really travel, or at least most of us, don't travel with the airplane from a company which has been blacklisted. Because we value our safety, we don't want to go in planes of companies which doesn't really uh, are safe enough. But we enter any accord and any uh, steps with uh, digital uh, applications, which might be maybe not directly killing us, but indirectly having a lot of influence of what we are doing. So we need to be much more vocal and also much more informed. I think it's one of the biggest issues which we need in this whole responsible AI is ensuring that education takes these things into account, both uh, understanding what is the ethical aspects, and also, and, but also telling people about what are the effects, possible effects, and also communication, and uh, the media has a very important role to do in these things. And maybe if they don't all the time put the pictures of the Terminator on their articles and uh, try to be a bit more engaging in what media is doing, I think those are ways to, to go about it. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question over there also. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for a, a inspiring and important uh, talk here. Thank you. Um, as, as you briefly mentioned, there, there have been news just the past week, both, of, of, both concerning data privacy and, and Cambridge Analytica and, mm -hmm. and what data is used for. Yeah. And also the, the Uber uh, managed car who, who yeah. ki killed a, a woman. Um, so, so it seems like we haven't really caught up on the ethics before things have started to go, go out, out of control now. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just, just like to ask, how do you extrapolate this, say, five to ten years time? Do you think we, we are catching up? Or will, will more things seem like they happened before we had really had time to take yeah. control? Thank you. Very good question. Indeed, we are maybe not uh, 
not in top of the happenings, but uh, we are not too late, definitely not. We would be too late if we would just quit now and say, okay, they are already making all kinds of mess and it's hopeless, we don't do nothing anymore. That's definitely not what we have to do. I think that even in those companies, and I don't know if they are there, uh, one of the many uh, activities and groups that are working on this are is a group which is started by those very large companies, so they are very well aware of the impact of what they are doing. DeepMind, which is one of the groups of Google which develops all kinds of uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms, just launched uh, one month ago a group inside them which is going to do research on ethical and societal impact only. And uh, another of those groups, which is called the Partnership on AI, is started by those companies exactly because they know that they have some responsibility in what they are doing. It's kind of a self-regulating group, but there are other groups involved there. So we are definitely not too late, and we have definite, but we need to keep uh, in the race and keep uh, ensuring that the, the dialogue and the uh, evolution goes with those systems. Of course, we cannot expect no system, no technology to be full, fully uh, safe. Always things will happen wrong. Things will be out of our control by all kinds of situations. But we do need to make sure to we indicate what is the minimum of safety or the minimum of uh, uh, whatever values that we want those technologies to take, on, take into account. I think there was... Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the government um, mm -hmm. because I mean I think we've seen in the US government or in China that they kind of um, step on the ethical part in order to manage uh, the big data or the data that they have of both mm -hmm. their citizens and all so I, I kind of wonder how AI as uh, or the, the responsible AI kind of um, intertwined with the ethics of each government. Like, yep. <laughs> probably uh, yes, it did. I talk here as a European in Europe. Uh, Europe is in this kind of things traditionally really the place in the world where ethics and responsibility and all those kind of issues are important, are part of our identity as Europeans. And it's something like you see, like this GDPR, it's only done in uh, Europe for now. But by doing it in Europe, this uh, GD GDPR is the regulations about data privacy, which will start in May. And by doing that in Europe, we are also demanding from other countries, and I know that the most work being done at this moment in ensuring compliance with GDPR regulations is not in Europe, it's in the United States, because they want to make sure that they can still be dealing with European citizens and the European uh, system. So Facebook has a huge group of people working just on ensuring that whatever they are doing is compliant to the GDPR. Of course, uh, like I just said, machines it will, will never be faultless. People are also never faultless. And there are governments which are more or less faultless. But by because some of them are maybe not so ethical, doesn't mean that we cannot try to take into account the ethics. And maybe by doing it somewhere, uh, we help other governments to realize that they can do things differently. We can just hope. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is perhaps more of a technical question. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to make the technical seminar yesterday. Yeah. Uh, but uh, isn't there a serious danger that, uh, while it might seem we have bought, uh, built an AI that properly optimizes for human values, it may in reality just optimize for a sort of proxy function that, that very closely correlates with what we want within this search space, but as its capabilities grows and its knowledge grows, it, it searches a larger space and finds an optimum we don't like. Yeah. Like, for example, it wants to make people happy, it makes people happy, then starts injecting people with heroin. Yeah. Naive example, but a good point. Yeah. That's the typical story of the paperclip factory by Nick Bostrom, indeed. So there are those dangers. And again, that's what why I say that we have to be explicit at all levels. We have to make all these choices and all these links, also the 
the translation functions that we make between happiness and some code, we have to make all those things very explicit. Because of course the machine might start doing things differently, or we might change our minds. What means happy today is maybe not what means happy in 100 years' time. So we need to make sure that we are able to inspect and to that make everything documented and explicit of what we have made. Maybe it doesn't really solve all the problems, but at least will help us understand what's going wrong with a certain system and possibly turn it, push it to the other direction that we think more appropriate. But there is a lot of uh, research to be done on this. There are uh, kind of abstract ideas and abstract plans, but really get down to the nitty gritty of these kind of issues to be a lot of research needs to be done. Uh, thank you for a good talk today. Um, so this is basically related to that question, mm -hmm. I guess. And what you answered now, what uh, were the paperclip factories, a good example where, where we need to be able to uh, look at the values on all different levels. But the, it might be a technical question as well. But mm -hmm. explainable AI, is that the only future where, uh, where we can achieve uh, sort of this, uh, where we have uh, values uh, that we can check on all different levels, or could it be that we have sort of systems as we have today where where we have machine learning models that we don't really know exactly how they work, but they seem to produce good results? Yeah, I didn't talk about this today, but uh, yesterday I hinted at that. Indeed, we, I don't really think we are uh, going to need to explain all the algorithms as long as we can guarantee, and by guarantees I mean mathematically, mathematically guarantee that whatever algorithms we are building are provable within a certain type of uh, behavior. So there is work being done, uh, notably by Stuart Russell in uh, Berkeley, about provably beneficial beneficial AI, in which it really is building this type of verification and validation mechanisms, which don't really look only at the, the type of algorithms, but at the effects of those algorithms. And then you can prove that those effects are within some kind of limits. So that's also a way to, to go forward. But like I say, there are many more questions than answers at this moment. So none of you who are working on AI has to be afraid of getting out of ideas and of problems to research in the coming, well, I don't know, 100 years probably. First, I wanted to thank you. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, you talk about regulation, um, that mm -hmm. basically people, groups of people coming up with the regulation. But we've seen that groups of people aren't always basically the most ethical. So how do we make sure that the shady ethics of some groups don't just transfer over to the shady ethics of th that yeah. they then put into AI? Yeah. That's actually one of the, thank you for the question, it's actually one of the areas of research that I'm doing in my group. And the way we are looking at that, and it's not like I'm pretending that that's the only way or the best way, but we are creating a kind of a network of ethical systems. So then you have uh, your own ethics that are shady or not, but those ethics are being checked by another ethics of someone else, or from your country, or from your city, or from the world. And in that way, you can point out, look, this system is working according to these ethics, but these ethics are actually not really according to these other ethics. And you can create some kind of levels from the universal human level, uh, rights to whatever your system is doing. So that's at least an to look at that. Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. I want to, you talked about responsibility in your yeah. presentation. And I want to ask if we say, like, I agree with the thought that artificial intelligence is itself could not be responsible mm -hmm. for their actions, yeah. but then to whom the responsibility goes, to the creator, to the user of the AI. And I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. So uh, I said that in one of the slides. One, one of the important issues here is to look at it's the responsibility doesn't go all to one type of uh, party, but it is to be distributed by a lot of people. Distributed by the governments, which allow or not 
the type of systems to be there and under the, the, which conditions, distribute to the people who use them, who read or not or agreed or not to whatever they use in those systems and the way they are using it. It's also a responsibility to the manufacturers that they make sure that what they manufacture is according to certain principles, like we do for any other type of technology. We don't allow any car to go into our roads without having some kind of uh, technical uh, uh, guarantee. the ways in which we can create a chain of responsibility by all the different parties involved and including all the, the context in which that system is involved. I don't really have an answer, but uh, at least we have to take into account many different uh, participants in that responsibility. Do we have a final questions? Somebody more? We are all happy. Okay. I want to thank you very much for thank you all. It was very nice to be here. And thank you all, thank the you audience, for, for being here also.